completed so we can begin the savings program. I want to thank you all for coming. It's very much appreciated. Before I introduce this evening's speaker, I'd like to mention the philosophy program really, really briefly in the Applied Ethics Institute and what it is that we do here. We, we try and host conversations and, and initiate conversations that are of public interest that uh, matter to non-philosophers. And uh, I think this evening is a pretty paramount example of that. But the kinds of conversations that we're having this evening are a lot of the conversations that a lot of the faculty in the department initiate in their research as well. So in the event that you are in philosophy class now, which I think a lot of you might be, or if you will be in the future, or have interest in these subjects, please don't hesitate to get in touch or to come up with me after this event. I'm happy to talk to you about our majors or minors and some of the courses that we're offering. But without any further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Professor Fisher. She received her PhD from SUNY Binghamton. Uh, she researches philosophy of space in relationship to social justice, uh, focusing specifically on questions of race, gender, sexuality, and class. She is an associate professor of philosophy at Lemoyne College. She's also the director of the Lemoyne's Literacy Empowers All People program which empowers K-12 children who live in poverty to get their words out into the world. If you could join me in welcoming her. Thank 
you see, this is the reactions of African Americans to um, the acquittal of the police officers that beat up Rodney King. And you can see the largest section here, the light blue indicates that they did not agree. That was, that was wrong to, to have them acquitted. 92% of African Americans polled back in 92 felt that that acquittal was unjust. And then the, the column next to it is European Americans and their reaction to the same verdict. And you see that there is a large segment that feel it is unjust, 64%. But clearly, there is a statistically significant difference between these two pillars. There is a 28% difference in the, in the reactions of European Americans and African Americans to the um, Rodney King um, verdict. Now you come over here, this is 2014, and we again have a, a, a divide. At first glance, it doesn't look as bad because that, that stunning number 92 just kind of catches the eye. But we're gonna look at this carefully. This is reactions to African Americans and European Americans to the fact that Darren Wilson was never indicted for his role in the death of Michael Brown. And as you can see, African Americans, 2% of them felt that that was unjust, that was wrong, he should have been sent to trial. European Americans, however, have a very opposite look. 78% of them said that that was exactly the outcome they expected, that, that Wilson was not guilty of anything and should not be indicted or tried. Now, like I said, that is so stunning, you think, oh well, as time's gone by, we've got about, oh, we might have to do math, we've got eight plus 14, 22 years between these that maybe things have gotten better, but the difference between this spot and that one is 40 percentage points here, and it was only 28 back there. Now this is just two pieces of data. It's not enough to say polarization is worse or better, but it's striking how different the perceptions of these two groups are. Now I'm gonna show you another chart. This one is reactions, this is just this week, of males and females to the testimony we just heard in the Senate Judiciary Committee. The first side shows you who believed Ford, and it's interesting, if I just put the data into PowerPoint, and PowerPoint chose my colors, the men are pink, and the women are blue. Okay, so it's kind of not what you're expecting, perhaps. But the people who believed in Ford are predominantly the female column, and not the male, and the people who believed Kavanaugh's testimony is better and, and more credible um, is predominantly male and not female. So what we have here is a divide that seems to line up with identity. And looking at that, you can argue, and I think I will, that there are identifiable groups in the United States that actually live in different worlds. Different worlds with such different values and such different frameworks that they actually have alternative facts. I wish you had a laugh at that one. Come on, alternative facts. No, but the idea is that the actual reality that they believe they're living in is so drastically different. Is it any wonder that we cannot talk to one another? So let's go down to, okay. Is this identity politics that's the problem? <laughs> Well, I'm going to, I went, I went on YouTube and I watched a little video, a cute little video from The Economist, which is a very nice um, magazine, that described what identity politics was. But what I really found striking was the comments on the video. So here are some of the comments. I know you can't read them, but I'm gonna read them to you. This is Jamie Dimon, who says, Identity politics is about shutting out dissenting points of view because you can't speak on behalf of another protected group. Another user writes, identity politics is moronic. It removes the individual and their agency and makes their immutable characteristics the most important way to determine how they should be treated. Identity politics is divisive and should be eliminated. Make sure I'm not double mic here. Okay, so that's that one. And then we have one more. This is Kylo Tarquin who says, 
This country has completely drowned itself in identity politics and political correctness. That's why we aren't getting anywhere. People are so damn afraid to have a conversation about anything anymore because they fear potential backlash. Now, some of the language here has been inflammatory, right? And the position that these people are taking may not agree with yours, but they are the honest sense, the honest feelings of some of your fellow citizens. So let's look at the content and try to get away from some of the tone of what they're complaining about. There is a lack of individuality when you put people in category groups called identities. There is a lack of agency in identity politics. And there is a lack of communication. These are real problems, and we need to address them, right? So perhaps what we need to do is get rid of identity politics entirely that I will no longer speak as if I am a woman. I will speak as a human being. We'll just all be human. Now, there is a lot of literature on this, and I'm not going to go into it. We have tons of other fun things to talk about. But I will just summarize briefly why that move won't work, why we can't just be human. First of all, the position of generic human has often been a mask for humans currently in a position of dominance. At this point in history, that is why it says gender, heterosexual men with property. In other words, when we just talk about what humans are like, we're often describing the characteristics of those who have the most power in that society. So we can't just be human. Also, many of us really treasure our identities. We, you know, there's a song, I'm Joy the Human Girl. I like that I'm a woman. And that's an important component of who I am. I don't want to embrace that. That would tear me apart crucial part of who I am. So that's a problem. But here's the most important one, and the one that's most personal to me. The solidarity that many people find when they meet with or work politically with other people who get it, the way you get it, that have shared your experiences, is actually life affirming. When you get together with other people who have experienced whatever identity crises you've experienced, whether it's racism, sexism, homophobia, and they understand it, and they tell you, you're not crazy, it happens to me too. You get to breathe, and you feel alive. And I've been there, and I don't know if any of you have been there, but I don't want to lose that. So the question is, can we do identity politics in a way that does not erase individuality, that does not take away our agency, and that does allow us to communicate. So, let's see where I'm talking, I'm going to turn the pages here. To talk about this, the first thing I want to do is talk about where identity politics came from. Because when you go back and look at it, at its roots, it's actually more complicated than, than you might think from the comments we got on the YouTube video, or even from the YouTube video itself. <coughs> the beginnings of identity politics were very humble. Nobody thought we were going to create this new kind of politics. They were just made some comments, and this movement kind of grew from it. So the, probably the earliest use of identity politics came in the Kumbaki River Collective Statement in 1977. Anyone here read the Kumbaki River Collective? Oh my gosh, run out and read it. It's short, it's wonderful, OK? Um, after pointing out the women who wrote it were people like Barbara Smith, and uh, Audrey Lord, so you know who they are. Um, they, they had noticed that they were working in civil rights space, organizing around the problems for African Americans in the United States. But they felt that within the civil rights movement, they as women were marginalized. They were not getting their issues heard, even though they were black women. And then they would go over to feminist organizations and they would try to work with feminist organizations and they would find that within those groups, they were marginalized as black. So they were like, we're not really here or there, but we're kind of in both places. So in this uh, statement, they say, quote, we realize that the only people who care enough about us to work consistently for our liberation is us. And so they make this statement of how they're going to go about it. Now, another very early statement comes from two works by Adrian Rich, who is a poet, who 
who wrote this in 1984, describing how she developed her personal worldview. My personal worldview was itself being created by political conditions. I was not a man. I was white in a white supremacist society. I was being educated from the perspective of a particular class. My father was an assimilated Jew in an anti-Semitic world. My mother, a white Southern Protestant. There were particular historical currents on which my consciousness would come together piece by piece. My personal worldview, which like so many young people I carry as a conviction of my own uniqueness, was not original with me. Rather, it was my untutored and half-conscious rendering of the facts of blood and bread the social and political forces of my time and place. There can be no doubt that our sense of self and of reality is profoundly affected by the relationships we have, most of them quite personal with our families, our friends, teachers, right? And then some of them much more pervasive, but less personal, like what we see in the media, what we get in the news, the historical of our day. Because of this, people situated differently in society will develop different world views. So at this point, all I've said is you have group A over here who's having a certain set of experiences and therefore develops a unique, what they think of as a unique world view, but it's really a shared world view. And then you have group B over here that has a different one. And that, that's kind of a nice little innocent, hey, we're different. We all just get along, right? But add to that the fact that we live in a society that does treat people differently depending on which of those categories they fall into. We live in a society that might exclude Jews from a country club, make it difficult for differently able people to access the world. We were just talking about how there's a ramp so that someone can get up to here, but they couldn't possibly get to the podium. Um, we have a world that encourages women to take nurturing roles in society, whether they stay home or they take a job in nursing or teaching. We live in a society where the stereotypes of men of color are athlete and thug and not much else. So once you have that happening, you realize that group A and group B aren't just different, that there are power fault lines between them. And that sometimes we are pushed into our identification, not because we chose that group, but because society pushes you in that direction. If African Americans are, and they are, I checked, two and a half times more likely to be ticketed for traffic violations than whites are, it is their identity as African Americans that is being targeted, realizing that it is their group identity that they've been assigned to by a dominant society that makes them targeted, it makes sense for them to organize as a group. An oppositional consciousness develops around the identity that is partially them moving together and partially where they can push by society. And it is this reaction to already having been identified by dominant powers that leads to the formation of a group like Black Lives Matter. So in this view of identity politics, identity is understood as categories. Put all the blacks over here, we'll put all the Latinos over there, we put all the Asians over here, right? Categories. But issues with identifying as black female or gay or Latino were obvious from the start, that that kind of categorical reasoning wasn't going to work, we knew right at the beginning. If we go back to the Kumbaki River Collective Statement, you remember they said, we're marginalized within the civil rights movement and we're marginalized within feminism. So they were already aware that you can't just throw me in the category of women and have that work. So they start their statement by saying the most general statement of our politics at the present time would be that we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression and see as our particular task the development of an integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking. 
Thus it is clear here, right at the beginning, that being black and female, being lesbian and poor, being all these things, is part of the identities of the women who wrote the statement. At the same time, Rich, in her statement, which I've already read to you, she mentions religion, she mentions her socioeconomic class, she mentions her race, she mentions her gender. So it's never a simple thing of categorizing people. The integrated and interlocking aspects of our social locations cannot be separately organized around without creating fragmentation inside of people and within the groups. So you have Audre Lorde who wrote, I find I am constantly encouraged to pluck one some aspect out of myself and present this as the meaningful whole, eclipsing or denying other parts of myself. In Inessential Woman, Elizabeth Spellman works through all the kind of, she's a delightful logical thinker, so she shows you all the logical messes that you get into if you try to do this simple categorization. But one of the images she uses is this. Whoops, pop beads. Now, I don't, I, she uses the phrase pop beads, and I thought I'd better bring a picture, because I'm old, I remember pop beads. I see someone nodding their head who might remember them from being a child. Oh, you remember them, and you don't look old at all. You look like them. Yeah. But pop beads are these colorful beads. You see them in this basket. This was the only picture I could get online that wasn't um, you know, copyrighted. But you take them and you pop them together and they make a long chain, right? So listen to what Vicki Spellman says about this kind of weird categorization using the image of pop beads. She says, um, this kind of metaphysics, this categorical metaphysics, claims each part of my identity is inseparable. Oh no, sorry, I got the typo. Is separable. Each part of my identity is separable from every other part. And the significance of each part is completely unaffected by the others. On this view of personal identity, which we might call pop B metaphysics, my being a woman means the same thing whether I am white or black, rich or poor, French or Jamaican, Jewish or Muslim. And if you think about that for half a minute, you'll see that, that being a Latina is very different than my being a white lesbian. My femaleness is not quite the same as someone else's femaleness because of all the other aspects of my identity. So critiques such as Lord's and Spellman's and the underlying understanding of multiplicity that we saw in the Kumbaki River Collective um, led feminist theorists to develop a new concept. They called it intersectionality. Kimberly Crenshaw is credited with first using the term in an article she wrote called Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex. In this article, she argues that, quote, the intersectional experience is greater than the sum of racism and sexism. The language she uses is one of axes. So then she's talking about a case she was on. She's a legal theorist, and there was a black woman who sued for discrimination against herself as a black woman. And the law could not find a way to handle this because they had, okay, there's discrimination against blacks, and there's discrimination against women. And where did your discrimination happen? And they pushed her to identify her discrimination as being either racial or sexual, but not both. And her case could not go forward because the company she was suing could prove that they had done good things for black men, and they had done good things for white women. So clearly, they were not either racist or sexist. But they weren't doing good things for black women, which is a problem. So Crenshaw analyzes this and gives us this image, the intersection. She says, consider an analogy of traffic in an intersection, coming and going in all four directions. Discrimination, like traffic, may flow in one direction and it may flow in another. If an accident happens in an intersection, it can be caused by car cars traveling from any number of directions and sometimes from all of them. So you could have this you know, bang up right in the middle. Similarly, if a black woman is harmed because she is at the intersection, her injury could result from sex discrimination or race discrimination or both. This analogy, Figures the black woman placed at this intersection that I've got here. Um, right in the middle of racial discrimination, which is going one of those ways, and sexual discrimination, which is going the other. So if black women are at this intersection, it follows that a black lesbian like Audrey Lord would be at the intersection of three roads. We'll need another road 
kind of coming through at an angle or something. And that would be heterosexism on the other axis. So we're going to look at this. This is the most complicated but still visible map I could find. This is the London tube map. So you might see the first intersection, the one Audrey, uh, the, the one that Crenshaw talks about, is here. So we've got sexism going one way, we've got racism going the other. And then Audrey Lord's intersection would have to look like that one, because I've got to add a line for heterosexism. But notice that she is on the racial line, but she's popped off the woman line. So how do I do that? Like, how do I get Audrey Lord on the map? And if you had yet a third woman, let's put um, Adrian Rich up there, who's a white lesbian, where does she go on the map? And as you start putting people on this map, you realize that there's some problems here. If I put a, say, white, um, heterosexual, cisgendered, property holding male on there, would he just be floating in this space? As it's not on any of the lines? I don't know. So it breaks down. Notice, and we're going to talk about our new favorite Crenshaw here. It's, I don't want to be silly. But um, it is not clear that there's any agency in the image she draws, even if we just go back to this one. She actually does a, a presentation on this where she has a picture with an actual silhouette of a woman in the middle, and she's just standing there. And Crenshaw's talking about the cars coming and running her over. And I'm thinking, why doesn't she run to the side of the road? But there's no agency in the picture. There is very little individuality if we're going to put all of um, the black women in one of those intersections and all of the white women in a different one. They're all clumped together. We lose their individuality. And there is no communication, because if we go back to this map, people are going to be spread all over these intersections. So how do they talk to one another? How do we move together in this image? So those are the three things that our um, YouTube commenters said we needed, individuality, agency, and communication. And I'm having a really hard time finding it in Crenshaw's metaphor for intersectionality. So like I said, I'm not trying to pick on Kimberly Crenshaw. I think this was a wonderful thing when she introduced intersectionality. And metaphors can all break down if you push them far enough. But the reason that I am pushing this one is to say that the problem isn't with the concept of intersectionality. The problem is with the concept of space that underlies these images, this metaphor that Crenshaw was using. So I think if I want to hold on to identity politics, and I do because it's life affirming, and I want to hold on to intersectionality, and I do because I think it answers some of those issues of fragmentation, I need a new space where they will work instead of this, this map that doesn't work. So now we're going to go talk about space. In fact, we're going to talk about space time. So right now, I think this is still the most prevalent view of space. We deal with what I'm going to call the modernist conception of space as a grid that it exists underneath everything. So you may have seen a map like this with the letters along the top and the numbers on the side so that if you want to know, like, where's my street? Oh, it's in C2. You can go, you know, find them. Right? But this same grid could be wiped clean, and we can just put a new map in there. That's the view of space I'm talking about, this grid that's still there underneath when you take the objects out. In the modernist conception of space, you can pick an object up from A1 and plop it down in D3, and the object's not changed, and neither is the space, much like puck beads aren't changed when you take them apart to put them back together. So, this is what you get in a modernist worldview. Space itself is timeless and unchanging. It's just that grid. It's never different no matter what you put Time, however, is where the stuff is happening. And in the modernist conception of space, you have this time laying there, I mean, you have the space laying there, and time flows over it, because modernism includes the concept of progress. We are getting somewhere. So we're flowing across this map. 
I want to also point out that this view of space meshes really nicely with the socio-historical moment of its inception. It was about the 16th century in the West, okay? This is the dawn of the modern era and what has been called the age of conquest. The view of space that became dominant was this one, that there is this absolute space just sitting there waiting to be conquered and time and civilization flows out over it and grabs it. And if you actually look at maps that were drawn of our hemisphere, the Western hemisphere, you can see you know, the, the march of Europeans across the Western hemisphere grabbing more and more space as they go. So, as time and space do interact in this view, we have to deal with the fact that as Europeans came to the West, there were already people living here. It wasn't, in fact, a blank and empty space. And there's people living different kinds of lives, and they're not part of this grand scheme of the flow of civilization, the story that we're telling from the West. So how do you deal with that? Well, this is what they did. They took difference and put it in time. In, they, they spatialized difference through time. Okay, that, that doesn't sound clear, but let me explain what you do. We take my world, right, Whatever, whoever the dominant person is, and I put myself at the front of the line. I am the most civilized. Hello, everybody, most civilized. And then I take someone else's world and I sit, make it stand behind me in line, in time. That one is backward or primitive or underdeveloped. Right? We know these terms. So this is something that an anthropologist named Johannes Fabian called the denial of coevalness. I take things that actually exist side by side, and I pretend that one of them really exists in the past. It's not here now. It's backwards. It's printed. Put it back there. So this is also part of this modernist worldview. And last, this all fits in the politics of the time and the spread of colonization. But this is not how spatial theorists now think about space. I think for many of us, you know, unthinkingly, we continue to use the modern misconception. But people who write about space and social space think about space as relational. And some of this also comes from Einstein and physics. It comes from a lot of different directions. But all these different movements are moving to a relational view of space. And this is what you have here. There is no absolute space already there. There's no space at all until you have objects. So you put these three objects in relation to one another on this, you know, someplace. Here they are. And a space <coughs> emerges here, outlined by the position of the objects that relate to one another. So the relationships of the objects are there first, and the space emerges. And if the objects <coughs> move, the space warps. The space changes size, shape texture as things move. So that is the relational view of space. And, and I'm sure that it makes perfect sense, right? No, probably not. So let me give you an example that may appeal to many of you that are students here at <coughs> college. You go to the dining hall, and your friends are there, and you create this wonderful space called our table, right? You may have to scoot up a few extra chairs to make enough room for everyone to be there, but it actually emerges as a space for you. And it has a border, just like you know, a city or a country or a state. And you're over, you're over getting some more soda, and another friend comes in, you go, oh, go on to our table's over there. So you've named it, you've claimed it, it's your space. And you all sit down at your table, and let's say some person, for some reason, just walks right in and sits down, like, right, right in here, just like, I'm going to sit down. And you don't know this, but you're like, what? This is our table, right? Your space has been invaded. It is that kind of thing that we're talking about when we say spaces are produced out of the relationship of objects moving together. And I'm really careful. I keep saying objects and not people, even though there's a lot of people in this picture. Because notice that this space is also shaped by the chairs and the tables. Right? There's other objects involved. And some spaces can be formed 
completely without any help from human beings at all. So I went to graduate school at Binghamton University, and there's a nature preserve. I'd walk through it every day. And the space at the nature preserve was dramatically produced and maintained by the work of beavers who would go out there and chew down trees, and they had a dam, and they had their lodge, and all that kind of stuff, which created a, a kind of a pond and then some wetlands, and then the red-winged blackbirds moved in, and I mean, the whole nature of the space was produced by the movements of certain beings in relationship to others, including trees and rocks and water and beavers and, and red-winged blackbirds, so they're all coming together in there. So that's how all space is formed according to this new view of space. Right? Now when I talk about our table, it's clear. When I talk about the, um, the beavers creating the dam, you can kind of see, oh, that space just kind of came out of nowhere. And then now all of a sudden I've got our table, and later we'll all go home, and they'll put the chairs back in their rows, and our table will disappear. But we don't think of that so much, and I should even read arranging this space a little bit since, since you guys came in. So this table, this room, you can see a little bit of that fluidity. But when you're driving down the street, you're on Genesee, you're just moving along, it doesn't feel like space is being produced by the relationship of objects. And the reason for that is that many of the spaces that we live in have been nailed down with asphalt or concrete or steel. We give them a semi-permanent structure. And then once we do, it's easy to start thinking about that modernist conception of space is always there because we put some things down so firmly that they are there for a very long time. But they weren't there one day. At least we can go back in time and find a day when Genesee wasn't there. And there may be a day in the future when it's not there anymore. So even these things that appear Things change. Okay. So, this relational view is common to most spatial theorists, but I'm going to focus on one in particular, Doreen Massey. Doreen Massey develops the concept not just of space, but of space time, and that's one of the reasons that I love her view. So, first of all, yes, like, like I've been saying, she believes that space is relational. She says, we need to conceptualize space as constructed out of interrelations, as the simultaneous coexistence of social interrelations and interactions at all spatial scales from the most local level to the most global. That's her definition of space. Her space is also dynamic, and that comes with the territory. If we're forming this out of relations and we move our relations around and we relate a little differently, our spaces will also change. Here's another important thing. For Massey, space always contains multiplicity. It is in the relation of things together that space emerges, right? So you have to have at least two things, because there has to be a relation. And it is this multiplicity that also makes change possible. She explains, quote, there must already be multiplicity to enable the possibility of interaction for change to be produced as a result. And for there to be multiplicity, there must be space. So space is necessary for change. And since time is the medium within which change occurs, skip her long parenthetical comment, the multiplicity that is space is constitutive of time. So all that wonderful and everything's happening in time thing that we got in the modernist view, she says it couldn't happen if it weren't for space first. Space is there. Time needs space to get itself going, she says. Time and space are born together, along with the relations that produce them both. And based on that, she insists that we talk about space time, not just space. Now, thinking about space-time is probably hard. Um, has anyone here a physics major and has successfully read Albert Einstein and gotten through it? Because I always get started and then it's like at a certain point my brain just clicks off, I can't handle it anymore. Um, so maybe none of us have had practice thinking in terms of space-time, but this is what I do on long trips because I'm thinking about space. 
I'm driving along on the interstate and I see a car maybe a mile ahead of me. And I can say, gee, that car is a mile ahead of me, which is space. Right? Or I can say, that car is seven minutes in my future. Because in seven minutes, I'm going to be where that car is now. Right? So in some ways, the car is both spatially and temporally ahead of me. It is that space time. So if that helps you, I hope it does. Okay? So it's also important Now we have a relational space. We have things happening. It's dynamic and it's space time. But dynamism doesn't always imply openness. It can be closed down. And Massey wants to say that this is open. Let me explain why, why it might get closed down. We talked about civilization pouring across the map of the other one, and that seems like dynamism, and it is, but it's closed. So in a modernist conception, I'm going to read to you from Pierre Laplace, who said, we ought to regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its anterior state, and as the cause of the one that is about to happen. Right? Given for one instant an intelligence which could comprehend all the forces by which nature is animated, and the respective situation of all the beings who compose it, an intelligence sufficiently vast to submit these data to analysis, it would embrace in the same formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the lightest atom. For it, nothing would be uncertain. And the future, as well as the past, would be present to its eyes. Now, hoping you're following me here. If we have cause and effect, and this, this state of the universe is the cause of this one, and then this cause is that one, then all we have to know is where we started from. And I can tell you what it'll be like when I'm all the way across the room, if I truly understood it all. Our only problem right now is that we do not have a clear understanding of everything that was going on in the universe during the Big Bang. But if we did, I could tell you with absolute certainty whether or not it's going to rain tonight, whether or not Kavanaugh is going to be confirmed, and who will be president in 2020. Because all of that will just flow necessarily out of the initial conditions that cause and effect is right. Now, you, so you can have all this dynamism and still have determinism. Massey does not want that. She says this, um, there is no grand na narrative, no one story of civilization with everybody lined up with the backward civilizations there and the more forward ones, the more developed ones here. There's actually relatively autonomous trajectories, she says. You have all these stories going on at the same time, think of a pile of spaghetti and each strand is a story. Okay, so, in, you have a diversity of narratives juxtaposed in a multiplicity that is the nature of space. Because this is a juxtaposition of relatively autonomous trajectories, and because those different stories meet up or don't combine or possibly contest one another. We don't know how they're going to react when they meet. There are always, she says, loose ends in space. Precisely because it is the sphere of the potential juxtaposition of different narratives, of the potential forging of new relations, spatiality is also a source of the production of new trajectories, new stories, it is a source of the production of new spaces, new identities, new relations, and difference. So we'll return to that bit about identities in a minute, but we have to add one more thing, and that is power. All right, so I've been talking about this four-dimensional space-time, and I've admitted to you that it's not easy to see. So I tried to make a PowerPoint picture of Massy space time. Obviously, this is extremely simplified, but you can see these little objects are relating to one another, and then each of these lines is both spatial and temporal. So this might be seven minutes behind, or a mile behind, or both, right? So 
So all of these things are related. And then they move. And your space is reshaped and reformed when they move. As we move, actual like clumps begin to form. And they form because of power. When I drove here today, I came from Syracuse, New York. I drove, do the math, 56 miles to get here. But it's really only 41 miles away. So where did the extra 14 miles come from? It comes from the fact that I have to go north up to 90 and then across. And if I could have just gone diagonally, it would have been 41. But those extra miles are here. So why would someone wanting to go from here to there go like this? That seems silly, right? But that's what I did. I did it because that's where Interstate 90 is. Interstate 90 is a space that has been produced by enormous power. You have to get the government to agree with you that you're going to build something. You have to get hundreds of people, maybe thousands, to dig and drill, and pour, and, and pave, and steamroll. You have to maintain that road. You have to keep reproducing that space. But all that power, once it produces the space, it does another thing. It changes how other people relate to the space. So let's unpack this a little bit. Relations produce a space. All those people working together in the hot sun, laying the concrete to begin with, produce the space. Now I've got a space, and that space produces my movement. And I'm relating differently than I would have related if it wasn't there. So not only do relations produce space, space produces the relations that then reproduce the space and it's much more likely that a space like I-90 will continually be reproduced than the space of our table will be continually reproduced. Although some of you may have, like, we always meet at the same corner of the dining hall and sit together. You know, so maybe your table has a little bit of permanence, but you have to keep remaking it. It won't last more than four years, right, until you'll graduate. Hopefully, four years. All right. So as these things move together, as one space begins to create that gravitational pull that reproduces relations, you have what is called a place. Now for Massey, a place is constructed the same way space is. It's just kind of a difference of degree, not a difference of kind. It's just a constellation of relations in one place. She insists that in this global sense of space, spaces themselves are open and relational and they are connected to the outside. Places are not, she says, closed in, even when the doors are shut, right? There is a relationship to the outside that constitutes what the place is like. And that's what you have here, where you've got this place that just enough things have kind of knotted or tangled up in one little bit of that spaghetti of space-time that it becomes a place. At the same time, I have these little purple guys who decided to all get together in the corner here. And when they start relating to each other, we'll have another new place developed. So that is Massey on place. Down the interstate. Sorry, I'm looking up and then losing. Okay, so. We have this complex space time. We had that earlier problem with identity politics. Now we've got to put it together. So let's match them. We have two options. We can use the modernist conception of space and try to see what identity would look like there. Or we can use Massey's view of space and see what identity would look like there. But we're going to start with the first one. So back in the modernist kind of space, I might say, here are the men, right there in their box, labeled men, right? And this is African Americans over here in this box. And then I'm going to say, yeah, but some of those men are African American, and some of those African Americans are men. And I'm going to be like Crenshaw 
and intersect them and drink some water. So there you see Crenshaw's version of intersectionality. It fits very nicely into the modernist conception of space. But there's a problem. Because some of these black men are also Latino. Where do I put them? Right? So you begin, and, and we've talked about this earlier when we were trying to get all those women on that subway map. It doesn't always work. So, it breaks down. The problem here is not, however, that there are just not enough dimensions to fit all the complexity of people so that I can have a grid for, for black male Latinos on here, black male Latinos that are gay, and black male Latinos that are Catholic, and black male, you know, I, I, can, I can start to proliferate blocks, as, and you can't do that in a two-dimensional grid. That's one problem. But the other is that this grid as we know, is static and unchanging. So you're stuck. You're stuck in your box. And you can't get out. We are trapped in what one of our YouTube commentators referred to as immutable characteristics, resulting in a divisiveness that makes us unable to move together in solidarity. So we end up stuck in a category where we might say, well, speaking as a woman, and you've heard this, right? Or you know all the men who say, well, I have no opinion on abortion, because that's not for me to say. That's for women. So all these things that make it impossible for us to communicate, we still have all the problems we had before. But if we take that intersectionality and put it on this map, you see it right away, right? There it is, intersectionality all over the place. If we were to adapt Massey's understanding of space, we would end up with an expanded dynamic conception of identity. Massey has pointed to that possibility when she said, as I quoted above, that places do not have single unique identities, and that the openness of our understanding of space is a source for production of new spaces, new identities, new identities, new relations, and new differences. If a place which is a tangle or a knot or a crossing or a meeting place of various temporal spatial trajectories does not have a single unique identity, as she says, then maybe people who are also formed by their networks of relationships do not have single unique identities either. When Rich described the formation of her identity, she talked about the relations of blood and bread, the relationships of heredity and living with. Those relationships take place in space-time. She is who she is, rich in this case, because of relations across time with her family's past and her nation's past. She is who she is because of contemporary relations across space, where she lives, where she works, who gathers around her dining room table. These space-time relations meet in a particular space, which is her own self, or her body, which rich defines as the geography closest in. She says, I need to understand how a place on the map is also a place in history within which, as, as a woman, a Jew, a lesbian, a feminist, I am created and trying to create. So I'm both emerging out of this and being created, but I'm also creative myself in my movement which brings us that agency we were looking for. How then do we understand identity in space-time? Identities are intersectional and relational. The complexity that Crenshaw pointed to would be honored, and we would be dynamic, open to transformation. So I am a white, middle-class lesbian. If I place myself in that modernist conception, if I go back here, in a box, right? I am frozen by the elements of my identity. The weight of white supremacy rests on me. My privilege is written on my face. I cannot escape it. And many of you may have felt that way at times.
happens when you're having conversations with others or trying to. Whiteness is a box I am placed in, and the definition of that box is determined by forces outside of myself. I am categorized by others as white. I am stuck as white. I am part of the category that enslaved and profited, that redlined and excluded, that turned fire hoses on children that called Mexicans rapists and drug dealers. And I want to move in anti-racist ways. Under the modernist view of space and the accompanying categorical understanding of my identity, it is nearly impossible for me to do that, to move in an anti-racist way. Now, when you're stuck like that, the temptation for white people, for men, for straight people, is to reject the categorization, to rebel against being thrown in the same box as everyone else who shares this one characteristic, whether you approve of their behavior or not. This is why we have hashtags that say things like, not all men. In the modernist conception of state, space, and identity, I'm stuck with no other option. I can either be white, just like every other white, or I can try to fragment the box into good whites and bad whites, or in the case of not all men, the good men and the bad men, right? But those are my options. And many of us who work in progressive politics know how frustrating those options are when you are the target of them, when you try to say, my life matters, and they say, not all men back at you, right? You're like, you're not getting it, so it breaks down communication. So the problem here is not your identity, the problem here is the space. We need to get out of that space and into this one, right? We, in the modernist conception, to identify is to be identical. The two words have the same root. In this, to identify is to move together, to be with, to connect. On the view where to identify is to be like them, I as a white person, just like Bob Kennedy, and just like they do, right? In this one, I can move towards Bobby, I can move away from Duke. Right? I have choices. So there is a theorist, Alison Weir, who's been trying to work through some of this. And I like a lot of what she has to say, but she doesn't talk about space, so I'm trying to push her a little further. She says, we need an effective, that's with an A, affective, emotional, model of identity, which she calls transformative identity politics. In her model, women choose to connect with others, and that movement produces the identity. So it's not that there is a box somewhere labeled women and all the women got into it and then said, hi, how are you? But all the women got together and started talking to each other and the word feminist got labeled onto what they were doing. So they were there first and the identity comes second. So she points that out. To combine that view with nasties, we can say that maybe these little purple ones that kind of join together down in the corner are people moving together and that brings each woman's relatively independent trajectory together with other women's, and as those trajectories join and cross and meet up, a place, a particular social location, an identity emerges. But it's a complex place. So just as Utica is a place formed out of the formation, juxtaposition of a lot of diverse trajectories, and here you all are, all these trajectories in this room now, each of you is a Utica but each of you is a Utican in a different way, not all identical, right? In the same way, feminists are kind of moving together, they hang out with one another, and so they're all feminists, but they're not all feminists in the same way. To summarize her view, Weir says, this alternative understanding of identity is ethical, political, as it's focused on meanings, values, and struggles for change. It is historical focused on processes of creating meaning through practice and through narratives over time. Oh my goodness, it's late. And finally, this understanding of identity is relational, formed through relationships with identifications, I mean, identifications with meanings, values, and other people. 
So that's weird talking. Notice she didn't say it's spatial. So I just kind of want to throw that in. But she does call this transformative. It is a model of identification mediated by power relations and by a desire to engage with, learn about, and be transformed by the others. Sounds great. Are you all convinced? I know it's late. I can't believe how long that took. But it may not yet make sense. So hang in, and I'm going to give you a concrete example. Most evenings, my partner and I walk for exercise and just catch up on each other's days. We walk through our neighborhood to the local park and back. Where are we as we walk? Consciously, the part that we pay attention to, our space is a small bubble just around the two of us as we chat and catch up. We are only peripherally aware of the storefronts, the trees, the other people, the dogs. There's a lot of dogs in our neighborhood. Yet our walking is predicated on specific social relations that make our bubble possible. The people who pour the sidewalks and that maintain them, the laws and customs that produce a level of safety as we walk, that, for example, direct the cars to drive on the streets next to us and not on the sidewalks, um, that dictate that they wait for us as we finish walking the crosswalk. So let's talk about that crosswalk just for a moment to see the larger socially constituted space that produces our ability to walk. There are white lines painted on the asphalt, the product of someone's labor, and whoever that is, thank you very much. We are indebted to those people. The white lines and the red octagon, octagon you know, the stop sign next to it are socially understood symbols that protect us even though they cannot reach out and stop two tons of steel from coming down on us. This is a form of life that's played by a certain set of rules. There is a history to this law making of steam rolling asphalt, of driver's education and licensing procedures that enables our walk. There are thousands of people involved in producing this moment where we glance at the traffic, step out boldly, and continue our conversation without worrying about the possibility of getting run over. We are walking on history, on many people's stories, as we confidently cross Westcott Street. Note that the constitution of this space is both personal and social. It's there in the present, and it reaches back across the past. The constitution of the space we walk in is material made out of asphalt, and paint, and sweat, and metal. And it is discursive, created in the symbols of stop signs and legal cultural norms. At the same time as we are walking, juxtaposed with our story, enabled in a causal relation by those same thousands of other stories, the person driving the car that stops has her story too. Why not? Don't even know. Right? She stops, she goes forward. We never talk. But the chance meeting of our story with the stories of other people and other living things can open up possibilities of new spaces as we walk through in surprising ways. Imagine that as a person walks by us with nothing more than a glance and a raised eyebrow or a lifted lower upper lip communicates disapproval of our lesbianism. This is not something we would usually encounter in the West Side neighborhood, and we might actually be holding hands because we feel safe there. There are places where we feel comfortable moving together in ways that make the lesbianism very clear. And there are places where we do not feel that comfort. Mary is a cautious person. In spaces where we're not sure, I would go ahead and hold her hand. But she is more careful. So when we are in those spaces, I do not take a hand or hug her goodbye when we part. Because I want to move with her. Because I stand with her. I respect I alter my movements to be with her. This alteration is part of the solidarity that Weir is looking for. This is the identification she is describing. To return to the walk, when we see the disapproving look on this person's face, other parts of our shared history suddenly shoot through our space and alter where we stand. We know stories of gay bashings. We've experienced smaller indignities, such as harsh words or symbolic gestures. 
We know these things both personally and on a larger social and historical level from the news, from stories others have told us, from having read Stone Butch Blues. The disapproving person has his own story. I don't know it. In some ways, we are in the same place, the same asshole, the same white, white paint. But in other ways, he is coming from a different place. Worlds are colliding. He passes. We exhale. The walk continues. Moving through a space constructed by many others, not in our control, but moving with agency through it, enabled by powerful people who orchestrated the building of roads and who now maintain and police the space, we walk with agency. We choose where we go, how we will relate to others, whether we we'll hold hands or not. Without denying the power of the dominant discourses and relations, we do have agency and individuality in this space. Now the walk through Westcott is fairly innocuous despite that brief moment of homophobia. This is not something we would have trouble talking about. So when I start off saying, can we talk? We need to talk about something a little bit more difficult. So let's do this. Once upon a time, there was a man named Darren Wilson and a man named Michael Brown, and they met in a place. It is the events that surrounded the shootings of unarmed black men by police that first got me worried, not just about race relations, which I had been studying for a while, but with how we talk about race and whether we could do so. And I noticed that when I talked to people about this situation between Derek Wilson and Michael Brown, that the people who wanted to say, Wilson was right to do what he did, Mike Brown did not obey the lawful command of a police officer, and he simply acted as he needed to given his profession. When they discussed Derek Wilson, they kept it tight. They kept it close. They talked about the street. So I have here this map of the street with the shell casings here <coughs> and where the car was. So the discussions I get from people who are defending Wilson are about where people were standing, what was said, what is happening in that moment. And it's a very tight in both time and space. So they carve out of Massey's complex big bowl of spaghetti. Just one little tight spot. They might, whoops, wrong way. They might reach out a little bit to tell us that Darren Wilson was well trained, that he had a good career as a police officer, or that he was a nice guy when he was a kid, or something like that. So I have this one little bit of Darren Wilson's past reaching away from that. But most of the discussion when I would talk to people about this and they wanted to defend Wilson, they would talk tight in. On the other hand, people who were upset and angry and protesting and wanted to talk about what was wrong in this situation would have a much larger picture. They would bring in someone like, this is Bull Connor. He was Commissioner of Public Safety in Birmingham, Alabama, and he ordered the use of fire hoses and attack dogs on children during the Civil Rights Movement. So now we're going back 50 years. And they might, I'll keep going the wrong way, they might also mention lynching. Go all the way back a good hundred something years, right? And connect Bull Connor and the lynchers to Wilson and the victims to my friend. That's spreading it out in time. They would also spread it across the country in space to Florida and bring up George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin. So the green line show you what people talking in defense of Black Lives Matter might mention, whereas the yellow lines are people defending the police. Now there was a few tight relationships that were mentioned, like hands up, don't shoot, which happened right there on the street. And then there's Mike's future that he had just graduated. That, you know, so these, these smaller ones might be mentioned as well. But if you look carefully at the, this is the discourse about them, you see this complete bifurcation of the space-time, with the green being 
the Black Lives Matter position and the orange being the Blue Lives Matter position, right? And there, there's very little overlap between the two slices of space-time that are being discussed. And I realized the problem is we can't talk if we're not even in the same place. And looking at this through Massey's eyes, these are two different portions of space time. Okay, so, um, so let's talk about this tightness around Darren Wilson. The tightness around him emphasizes his individuality. He's just a guy, just one man. He does not represent all police officers or all white men. It is constitutive of whiteness, however, that whites are viewed as individuals. When one of us goes wrong, we are not viewed as evidence of depravity as a whole race. If an individual does really, really well, we do not say about a white person, oh, he's such a credit to his race. Whites are always treated, or usually treated, I should never say always, um, as individuals. We are understood to have earned our place as a result of our own self, our own hard work, not racial privilege or our categorization as white. This view, this tight in view, also constructs Michael Brown as responsible for his own individual bad acts. He stole cigarettes from a convenience store and then he got shot by the police. It's his fault, right? This is a movement through space and time that focuses tightly on individuals, and this way is a very white way to move through space and time. At the same time, when you do go to the larger scope, we unwittingly erase the individuality of the people. Michael Brown's individual self is erased, his agency is erased when we go just to the big green sweep. He becomes one more black man shot by one more white man, and it's black versus white, and there's no individuality or agency in that either. So if we take Weir and Massey seriously, we need to think about how we move with these people that are talking in these two completely different ways. Now, I want to add one more position to this map and it's an, probably the most important one. Where are you? I made this map, and I was trying to tie this talk up, and I thought, like, okay, so we're in two different worlds, that's why we can't talk. We need to acknowledge the complexity of all these relations in order to have a healthy discussion. I think that's a good message. But at the same time, I was kind of stuck, and I realized why. Because I'm here looking at where am I? I am in some kind of ethereal, disconnected spot, pulled out of time and space. And it won't surprise you to know that that position, which has been called the God's eye view or the view from nowhere, is also a view that is more commonly taken by people with power. So it's very white of me to look at it this way. So I tried, with my feeble PowerPoint skills, to turn the map. This <coughs> is what we need to look at. All right, so let me explain this with a reference to my favorite sport, football. When you watch football on television, which I love to do, it's wonderful because you can see the whole field. And there's my buddy Drew down there, you know, and I'm like, Kamara's open, Kamara's open. And I can see that Kamara's open, like throw the ball, man. Kamara's open. Drew Brees is one of the shortest quarterbacks in football. So he's not out here looking in. He's standing here with the offensive line and the defensive line in front of him, and his receivers are way downfield. How is he supposed to know that Kamara's, it's amazing that he does as much as he is really, if you don't know Drew Brees, look him up, it's amazing. But I have to look through this mess and recognize the receiver and throw the ball. And that's how you win the game, right? This is real life. Real life is not 
distance with the TV set, and you know how they nicely put the little yellow line for where the first down is going to be, you know, and you're like, dip across the yellow, there's no yellow line on the field for you, right? And the players don't know, they kind of have a vague sense, we got to get about there. And they're running, and they're moving, and other people are moving into them. That is how our life is in space and time. We are actually embedded in it. So I try to add us. Here we are, me and you, right there. And I'm trying to get that to be this, this sight from on the field. And you're looking through to see the, how the history has led here. And maybe you don't know that history. Maybe Bull Connor is a whole new idea for you after tonight. And if you don't know it, you cannot move in relationship with him. So when we sit down, you and me, and we're going to talk about Mike Brown, Darren Wilson, I need to look at how you're moving, just as I very carefully look at whether or not Mary wants me to hold her hand. I need to do the things that we are said. I need to um, learn from you, listen to you, be transformed by you. When I walk with Mary, I have to decide how I'm going to move with her. And that may mean paradoxically at times that I will not touch her. That I seem to not move with her at all. I relate to her with attentiveness to who she is, the spaces we are in, what she needs in that moment. And I know where she comes from. I know her history, right? In a similar way, when we move through these conflictual, conflictual places in space-time, the places where we have conversations about these kinds of situations, we have to decide how we will acknowledge all the complexity of space-time relations that we are moving through. How will we tell other people we're talking about maybe their blind spots? And how will we listen for ours? How am I responsible for my movement in relationship to Bull Connor? Because I too, you know, am a southerner, and I too am white, and I want to figure out how to move away from him in ways that aren't just cutting him out. If I go back to that statement from Rich about the truth of blood and bread, the blood connects me to people that are racist. I will tell you there's people in my family that are racist. But who sits at my dining room table and who shares my bread is something I have agency about. I need to learn, I need to grow, and I need to move in solidarity with others, constantly looking for that opening, that bit of sunlight that Vince Lombardi said to look for, right? And make the pass. And knowing that a lot of times you're going to miss, that you're going to be wrong and be humble about that. If we can do that, submerged in space time, not outside looking in, if we do that, then maybe we can talk. That's it. We can do questions, and I really appreciate your patience. That went a lot longer than when I practiced. I will do my best to spot the people who have their hands up, and I'll acknowledge you as being about to leave your hand up the whole time. If you have a question, please do your best to get my attention. Thank you very much for um, a really fascinating talk, and I really appreciated all of the um, images and stories and the way that you brought them through your lives. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, I was, my question though was I'm like wondering if you think that um, kind of modernist concept of space is really the best explanation for the polarization that you showed at the beginning as opposed to a kind of uh, human psychological need for tribal affiliations or other I mean other um, proposals that have been that have been um, given for to explain this polarization values and worldviews. Um, or is it do you really think that it's kind of a somehow this subconscious modernist view has just kind of trapped us um, you know, in, because we're European, Europeans or something like that. I think, I think
think the modern conception of space is part of it, and then the categorical thinking that goes so nicely with it. I mean, I think there's a bunch of layers that make us think in these boxes. And I think when you say that there's a human need for tribal affiliation, um, I'm going to just go out on a limb and say, <coughs> if we can get our heads out of that categorical view, which we can trace all the way back to Aristotle, right? Categories, kind of categories. Um, I think that that view follows from a certain approach to the world where you're looking for differences, you're looking for are you on my side? So it's uh, an antagonistic view, which kind of fits very nicely with capitalism, which is a nice another one of these layers that creates it. But I don't know for certain we'll get over in this other space time and all that tribalness will go away. I can't promise that because we haven't tried it, but I know it won't go away if we don't do something different. And um, I, I actually, in my politics, so much look for like the, what's true is important to me, but what's more important is what enables justice. So letting go of the tribalism is more likely to enable justice. So I almost like, just with faith, believe I've got to try, I've got to move beyond it. Um, I don't know if it's constitutive of human nature to be tribal. I think it's constitutive of humans in certain social relations to behave in a tribal way. So if we can change the relations, we might remove that aspect without that. that makes sense. Try to be optimistic. Dr. Fisher, um, I'm a senior at the college, Clay Thomas. Thank you for coming to UC. We appreciate you coming here. Um, something that stood out for me on your talk um, on the first couple of slides was uh, based on your research, um, do you really think the generic human in the position of dominance really is white heterosexual males that own property? And the reason why I say that is being um, raised in um, uh, the country and uh, uh, not being a racist and being in the U.S. military, it's kind of difficult to get jobs, get positions um, uh, that uh, being as a European uh, Caucasian women do too. Um, and with the rise of Islamic and uh, Hispanic um, population in this country, I would argue that that is Okay, so there's a lot there. First, I want to thank you for your service. Um, my son's at Fort Bragg, so I'm very, very proud, of, proud of my army son. Um, the, the statistics would actually speak against you that, in fact, if you look, I mean, if you just look at the, the government, look at just that, the most powerful politically, they are overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male, and they're all rich. Right. Where I remember one year everybody got kind of like spastic and excited because so many women had been elected. There were 20 female senators that year. 20. Now, what is the percentage of women in the in the population? 50 percent. And what would 50 percent of the Senate be? There's there's a hundred senators, so that would be 50. Women. And we had 20, and people were losing their stuff. They were freaking out. 20 women, oh my gosh. Um, the men still have control of government, okay? White men still have control of government. Straight white men with property still have control of government. And then if you look at CEOs of Fortune 500, just look at the stats. They change from time to time. I've looked at them at various times, and I've yet to see in a real, real, like, who is in charge of those big corporations? Pretty much white men. And, but you're right to say that our, the population of the country is shifting and there will be a point not too long in the future, I think in about 10 years, there will be no majority. Everyone will be a minority because there's just so many different groups. And that's a different feeling when you're kind of like used to being the norm against which everything else is judged and all of a sudden you're not. 
if I understand the disorientation that that could cause, but I don't think you need to panic just yet. You know, and, and that um, white men are no longer in charge, or that you won't get a job, I'm sure, with your army background, you will. Um, hey, I'm so optimistic, yes. Um, so I think that actually we do still live in, in and, and the argument I made is that whoever is in charge gets to be the generic human. So if things flipped, then that would be the new generic Um, thank you very much, first of all, for your talk. I found it very interesting. Um, so I'm curious if we take the space terminology a bit farther and we talk about the second law of thermodynamics, the idea that anything can increase things, we're going from order to disorder. And I would say that we're getting more diversity in that sense, and diversity of types. And so I don't know if Matthew says this, but I'm curious if Matthew or you would agree that part of what you're kind of showing here is that with this relational dynamic, because she, in, in politics and space time, she says there's three reasons that I'm going for for this time space, and one of them is physics, but there's also radical feminist geography, there's also you know, some political movements that were going on, and she says, I don't want to make science like the anchor, the foundation, because science is just yet one more way of looking at things, and I don't want to privilege it in that way. Um, so, bringing in the, the second law, right, second law of thermodynamics, to be kind of like, well, I don't know. Um, but as far as the proliferation of difference, I think, oh, I mean, peoples is peoples. We've always had gay people, we've always had um, women, we've always had people from different, what we now call races. Race is actually a concept that was born in this period, the modern period as well, but yes, we have races. I think the resistance that we've gotten through the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the gay rights movement, the kind of, you know, like all of a sudden, all of the different people are not no longer quiet about it, um, may make it feel like, oh, there's this proliferation. But I do think, I, I, I think what I'm seeing in your question and I'm sympathetic to is this idea that that we have to have this long list of, hi, I'm a white, southern, raised, lesbian, middle class, cisgendered, you know, like, and I have to have this long list, and it becomes cumbersome and maybe eventually meaningless. And I think actually her position where you see people kind of moving with each other, and they can all be very different, but they're moving together, is, you know, just avoids this continual fragmentation of identity, and I think that's what you're pointing to, is that we're just almost at the point where you can't talk to anybody, because nobody's like you. But you might be moving with people, even if you're not like you. So I think she might help in that regard, rather than increase the population. I can follow up on that. Okay. Um, curious what But 
One thing that I do want to say is that maybe the X, Y's, and Z's are not as clearly defined as they may seem. So that, you know, I, I do a lot of work on masculinity and I'd like to put up a, a picture of Fred Rogers, you know, from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, and you know, and I put up all these different pictures. And you know, these are all men, you know. This is, what does it mean to be a man? And what is the essence of the maleness? Because they're all very, very different. You know, I put them all up there. It's just, you know, so I, I think they've been externally boxed in, a, in maybe a clear delineation of what people hope is a clear delineation. And then you have someone like Plessy where he almost slipped out of the box and they pushed him back in. Because um, we're not sure how to handle some of these cases that are not as clear. But with disability, you know, I'm just, your field, and here's just one little thing. My daughter-in-law is a special education teacher, and she has taught me about universal design, which I absolutely adore this concept. So if you don't know the concept of universal design, is you don't say, okay, so all the disabled kids come over here, and we've got something for you to do, while the typical kids come over here and we'll do it the usual, the normal way. Yeah. Instead of that, you universally you design something that is universally accessible accessible for all. And I think that if we are to move together with people that are different able, we need to have universal design. Um, so I think Nancy would push for that kind of, it's not a matter of can we get all the disabled people to work together, but can we get our world to work with disabled people by moving with them responsibly. Mm -hmm. That's just, like I said, I have to look at it. Question about uh, kind of the implications of the theme for um, like how we should conduct conversations or how we should kind of try to engage in these places and what's happening. Um, do you think that things like social media, like Twitter, and Facebook are not the right tools to use for this because it's just such a short you know, snapshot of the view and it doesn't really enable us to get to this depth that we want people to get to? And do you think that? I'm, I'm not sure. I, mean, I have a friend who just went off everything and she's telling me how free she is and that everything she let go. I kind of want to listen to her. But um, I think on my own Facebook news feed, and this is a, a story of failure, I'm not dragging it off. I do have some friends that I have known for a very long time and they're extremely right wing. They say they think conspiracy theories that I just think, oh my gosh. And one of the conspiracy theories, which was really troubling, was that Snopes is a liberal conspiracy. So even when I went to try to co correct some misinformation that she had put out, then she told me that Snopes was not to be trusted. So then now what do we do, right? We can't even fact check. Um, but I do try to, I do have friends who have tried to clean, I mean, Facebook will do it for you, but some people are more active and they go through and they unfriend people that say anything they don't like. And I still have my friends that, are, that I don't always agree with. And I think that maybe there's a way to try to do that. I don't think I'm doing it really well. I get irritated and I just don't comment and I scroll on and go look at the puppy pictures because they make me happier. Um, but, so I don't know. Social media is a really weird space and there are, not me, but there are social theorists who talk about that virtual space and, you know, that would be a place to look at my answer that. Any other questions or comments? Now, well, then please join me in thanking Professor Fisher.